Good morning. My name is Rob, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Organogram Holdings Second Quarter Fiscal 2022 Results Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press the star one. Thank you. Craig McPhail, you may begin your conference. On today's call, should be aware that it will contain estimates and other forward-looking information from which the company's actual results could differ. Please review the cautionary language in today's press release on various factors, assumptions, and risks that could cause our actual results to differ. Further, reference will be made to certain IFRS measures during the call, including adjusted EBITDA and adjusted gross margin. These measures do not have any standardized meaning under IFRS, and our approach in calculating these measures may differ from that of other issuers. So these measures may not be directly comparable. Accordingly, these non-IFRS measures are intended to provide additional information and should not be considered in isolation or as a substitute for measures of performance prepared in accordance with IFRS. Please see today's earnings report for more information about these measures. Listeners should also be aware that in making certain statements relating to market share data, the company relies on reputable third-party data providers. I would now like to introduce Bina Goldenberg, Chief Executive Officer of Organogram Holdings, Inc. Please go ahead, Ms. Goldenberg. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. With me is Derek West, our Chief Financial Officer. For today's call, we'll discuss the financial results for the three months ended February 28, 2022, and I will provide a general business update. We will then open the call for questions. I'm happy to report that second quarter of fiscal 2022, we continued the progress of the past several quarters. We again achieved record net revenue in the quarter, the highest in the history of the company. We grew our market share and now hold the number three position among Canadian LPs in the recreational market in Canada. And most importantly, we achieved a positive adjusted EBITDA of $1.6 million two quarters earlier than we projected at the start of the year. Also in the quarter, as we announced in our last call, we acquired Laurentian, an artisanal craft grower and premium hash producer based out of Quebec. The net revenue in Q2 was $31.8 million, a 117% increase over Q2 of fiscal 2021. This is a record level of net revenue for Organogram and demonstrates our continuing success at understanding consumer needs, innovating to best address market demand, and introducing compelling brands and products that resonate. And we continue to grow our market share. In February, we secured the number three position in market share among Canadian LPs for the second month in a row, with a share of 8.2%, according to HiFire. In March, the momentum continued with another 20 basis point gain for a market share of 8.4%. We also continue to hold the number one position in the flower category, which represents about half of the Canadian cannabis market. Our Shred Mills flower products are the top sellers in Canada, with Shred Tropic Thunder being the best-selling flower product in the country. We also hold the number three position in the gummies category, having doubled our market share quarter over quarter, with two of our SKUs amongst the top 10 best sellers in the country. This market position includes Shred and Gummies, which were introduced this past August, and Monjour, our large format CBD infused soft chews, introduced this past November. Edison Jolt, our unique high potency THC lozenge, maintains its best its position as a best seller in the ingestible extracts category. Now moving on to innovation, we recognize the need to bring news to the category, so we continue to launch new products. We have leveraged our Shred brand that has achieved high visibility among can cannabis consumers. In March, we shipped ShredX Keep Infused Blend, an innovative product that combines the convenience and popularity of Shred milled flour with the potency of Keef in a 50-50 ratio. We also launched ShredX Vape, these are 510 cartridge vapes with the flavor profiles of shred milled flower products, Tropic Thunder, Mega Melon, and Funk Master. 
And how are we doing? Well, within days of launch, ShredX Tropic Thunder was the fourth best-selling vape in Ontario. Building on the success of Shredem's gummies, we added unique line extensions, Shredem's pop gummies in the classic pop flavors of cola, root beer, and cream soda were introduced in March. We've also added two new sour flavors, sour apple slap and sour blue raspberry. With eight SKUs now available to consumers, we expect to strengthen our market position in the gummy category. We've also added two new premium strains to our Edison line with Edison Kush Cakes and Edison Frozen Lemons. These high potency and terpene rich additions will create further engagement with cannabis enthusiasts. With Big Bag of Buds, our large format value brand, we added Pink Cookies, a high potency indica strain. This expansion of our product line addresses the desire for specific strains by value seeking consumers and reflects the evolution of the Canadian cannabis market. International sales also bolstered our Q2 results. We shipped approximately 1,700 kilograms of dry flour to Israel and Australia in the quarter, marking the highest international B2B shipments in the history of the company. We expect to have further shipments to Canadoc in Israel and Canatruck in Australia in fiscal 2022, and we'll look to expand our international partners to ship more wholesale dry flour. Now let's look at operations, beginning with Laurentian. After acquiring, acquiring Laurentian in December, we began working on integration. One of our priorities was to increase the distribution of its unique Tremblant hash and Laurentian craft flour products. At acquisition, Laurentian products were available in four provinces. By the end of the fiscal year, we will be available in all 10. In Ontario, we've been successful at increasing distribution levels of Tremblant hash from 25% to almost 40% of Ontario's 1,500 stores and have grown sales by 21%. This Ontario example underscores our success in leveraging our marketing, distribution, and field sales capabilities to drive results. We expect to be able to achieve the same success across Canada as we increase the footprint of the Laurentian brand. We are also making progress in expanding and automating production at Laurentian. Construction and licensing for the additional space is expected to be complete by the summer of 2022, with a four times increase in cultivation capacity and increased automation, processing, and storage space to be achieved by the end of 2022. Hash production at Laurentian is now supported by high quality and high potency keef coming from our Moncton facility. This was identified as an acquisition synergy. At our Moncton campus, we are completing the Phase 4C expansion and expect to reach upwards of 80,000 kilograms of dried flour capacity. Environmental enhancements are currently in place in approximately 40% of the facility and should be fully implemented by the end of the year. These upgrades have and will continue to further enhance yields and flour quality as they are completed. We currently have two automated pre-roll lines and we'll be adding high-speed pouch filling lines for shred and big bag of buds by the end of fiscal 2022. In Winnipeg, adding on to our highly automated gummy production line, we have automated labeling and excise stamping and our commissioning pouch packaging equipment. We have also upgraded and leveraged our warehouse to optimize our logistics network and drive freight savings. These changes help improve our efficiencies, margins, and customer service. The build-out and improvements in Moncton and Winnipeg reflect our strategy to make investments based on recognized business needs and strong payback. In the quarter, all large-scale construction projects were substantially completed at the Product Development Center of Excellence in Moncton. The Biolab is being fully equipped in Q3, and then we will begin to conduct advanced plant science research. In the quarter, our joint R&D efforts continue to progress well, and we look forward to applying the discoveries and deep scientific knowledge to both strengthen our existing market products, as well as develop new consumer-centric innovations. It's important to note that BAT's support for the product development collaboration and Organogram as a whole was further showcased at the beginning of March when they invested $6.3 million into the company. 
This investment was made through the exercise of their top-up rights pursuant to an investor rights agreement and increased their equity position from 18.8% to 19.4%. Also, as mentioned in our call last quarter, in December, we increased our cumulative investment in Hyacinth Biologicals by $2.5 million to $10 million for a strong minority position. Hyacinth's advanced research into using biosynthesis to produce THC, CBD, and rare cannabinoids without using cannabis plants provides us with another avenue to innovate in the future. Through these collaborations, and in addition to our in-house R&D capabilities, we will continue to produce unique, exciting products for the Canadian consumers and, subject to terms of the PDC, create proprietary IP that we can introduce globally. Now I will turn it over to Derek to present the financial overview. Derek? Thanks, Mina. Turning to our earnings results for Q2 fiscal 2022, gross revenue grew 128% from Q2 2021 to 43.9 million, and net revenue grew 117% from the same period in fiscal 2021 to 31.8 million. These revenue increases were primarily due to higher recreational net revenue, which grew 108% from Q2 of fiscal 2021, and the completion of international shipments to Israel under our agreement with CANDOC and to Australia through Canatrack. While gross sales grew 128%, cost of sales decreased 20% year over year to 25 million. Lowering our total cost of sales during a growth period was as a direct result of increased efficiencies at our production facilities, combined with improved inventory management. We harvested approximately 10,000 kilos of flour during Q2 of fiscal 22, compared to about 4,500 kilos in Q2 of fiscal 2021, an increase of 125%. Over the past year, the company has experienced a growing demand for its products, and this led to increased planting and cultivation levels, which when combined with higher flower yields per plant than as compared to the prior year's comparison quarter, this resulted in the doubling of our harvest. Largely due to higher net revenue, a reduction in inventory provisions, unabsorbed inventory costs, and a lower cost of sales per unit, the gross margin in Q2 improved to 6.9 million from a negative 16.5 16.5 million in Q2 of 2021. On an adjusted basis, gross margin was 8.3 million compared to a negative 700,000 in Q2 of fiscal 21. We expect that we can continue to achieve efficiencies and better economies of scale from the three facilities, lowering production costs. This, combined with contributions from higher margin products, will further improve margins. SGNA excluding non-cash share-based compensation, increased to $14 million in Q2 2022 from $10.3 million during the prior year's comparison quarter. And this was largely due to higher employee costs due to increased headcount, including the acquisition of Laurentian, general wage increases, increased professional fees due to technology investments, and higher trade investments and marketing spend initiatives. In the quarter, we achieved positive adjusted EBITDA of 1.6 million, a 9.4 million improvement over a negative 7.8 million in last year's comparison quarter. This is the result of the continual improvements in our business, including higher sales volume, lower production costs, which generated higher gross margins and operating incomes. We achieved positive adjusted EBITDA two quarters earlier than projected at the start of the year. Based on the momentum we see in terms of increased sales and improved efficiencies, we expect to generate positive adjusted EBITDA into the future. Net loss for the quarter was $4 million compared to a net loss of $66 million in Q2 of fiscal 2021. This large reduction in the net loss was due to the increased sales and higher gross margins I've already mentioned. In terms of our statements of cash flows, cash used in operating activities was less than $1 million during Q2 of fiscal 2022, compared to cash used of $10 million 
in Q2 of fiscal 2021. The year-over-year -year improvement is primarily due to the current period's operating income. Cash provided by financing activities was $6 million during Q2 fiscal 2022, compared to $51 million in cash used in the prior year's quarter. During the current quarter, the company received $6.3 million from proceeds from shares issued to BAT. Cash used in investing activities was $23 million during Q2 fiscal 2022, compared to cash provided of $18 million in Q2 of fiscal 21. The cash used in Q2 of this year reflects the $7 million in cash consideration for the acquisition of Laurentian, $2.5 million for the additional investment in Hyacinth, $8.7 million for facility expansion and improvements, and $4.5 million invested into restricted cash to be used to fund the Center of Excellence. In terms of our balance sheet, on February 28, 2022, we had $151 million in unrestricted cash and short-term investments, compared to $184 million at the end of fiscal 2021. The decrease during fiscal 2022 is primarily due to the company's investment in its working capital assets and capital expenditures for facility improvements, the purchase of Laurentian, and the additional investment in Hyacinth. This concludes my comments. Thank you. I would like to turn the call back to Bina. Thanks, Eric. The first half of fiscal 2022 has shown the success of our strategy to create exciting products and brands that are embraced by the market to maintain efficient operations and deploy capital wisely. This will continue to be our focus, which positions us for success for the rest of the year. I'll reiterate that our investors can continue to expect strong revenue and volume growth driven by expanded distribution, more new and exciting product and brand introductions, continued international sales, further improvements in our adjusted gross margin, and continued positive adjusted EBITDA. Thank you for joining us today. I look forward to updating you on our progress. And now, operator, you may open the call for questions. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Our first question comes from the line of Aaron Gray from Alliance Global Partners. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, and uh, congratulations on the quarter and reaching the EBITDA target two quarters ahead of, the, of what you originally expected. Um, so first question for me, uh, just on the EBITDA. So thinking about the EBITDA margin opportunity longer term, right? So not even flexed into EBITDA profitability, expect that to continue going forward. Just how best do you think about, you know, the EBITDA margin opportunity maybe in the next you know, 18 to 24 months as you expect, you know, continued improvement on the gross margin side and sales uh, ramping up? Thank you. Derek, over to you on that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're confident that we'll continue positive adjusted EBITDA based on momentum over the past few quarters. Into the future, with the increase to our capacity at all our facilities, this will result in economies of scale, which will lower our production costs, which will improve margins. Um, there's also, as well, the uh, additional contribution from Laurentian, which has a higher average uh, price per, per, per unit, just based on it being a, a premium product. And uh, this, as well, contributes to a positive margin. But bear in mind that uh, as we, we need to continue to invest in our business to support the continued growth. And um, so while we expect to have a growing EBITDA, you know, we're not providing specific uh, guidance at this time in terms of being a percent of revenue, but we do expect uh, with all the momentum we have with increasing sales demand, increased uh, capacity to uh, have higher sales through, through throughput with lower cost per unit, that ultimately we are well positioned to have um, increased to our EBITDA over time. Okay, great. Thank you much for that, that color and detail. Um, second question for me uh, on international, right? So a nice uh, sequential increase once again in the quarter. Um, looks like you're expecting for continued you know, momentum there on that front. I uh, just wanted to clarify specifically in terms of the shipments during the quarter, was there anything on the timing side, do you feel like those are going to be, you know, reoccurring? Is this a good, you know, run rate on the go forward? And then 
just any color you could provide maybe on, on the margin. I know it's a higher margin, and we've kind of gone over this before, but the margin differential in terms of, you know, the international versus the domestic revenue. Thank you. Right. So thank you for the question. Um, so first of all, uh, we do expect to see ongoing shipments uh, to both Israel and Australia. Um, you know, we obviously turn the, the paperwork, import quotas, uh, import documents, export documents, and, and need to get those, um, you know, turned before every shipment. So that continues to be the regular cadence of our business. And we expect to see more shipments, obviously, for the balance of this year. Um, in terms of your question on margin, I mean, the, the real answer is, um, you know, there's no excise uh, tax on uh, international, uh, on any B2B sales. And that's the significant improvement in margin over just rec general recreational sales. Um, it obviously comes with different kind of testing uh, requirements. So there's a, a bit of offset to that, but um, it's good margin business and nicely complements our recreational business. All right, thank you very much, and uh, congrats on the quarter. I'll jump back into the queue. Thank you. Your next question comes from a line of Tammy Chen from BMO Capital Markets. Your line is open. Great, thank you. Good morning. Um, first question I had is specifically on your rec sales. Um, you described how you're continuing to see momentum and your share, market share has continued to expand. So I'm just curious, like, why did your uh, net rec revenues decline a little bit quarter over quarter um so so we have a bit of a, a timing so overall tammy our, our momentum is solid and we saw our market share grow again in march we had a bit of a of a challenge during the month of january with omicron as it ran through our facility and um you know we had some high absenteeism that impacted our fulfillment we got we had the highest shipping month um, in February to get a product out, um, but we had some sort of a little bit of timing issue uh, that rolled into some s solid uh, momentum into the month of March. So that's what you're seeing on the um, rec uh, side of the business. It's uh, our market share continues to grow, so the offtake isn't a problem, but we did have a little bit of timing issue through the quarter as a result of that uh, disruption. Okay, I understand. Um, and then my, my follow-up question is, um, so if I look at the broader high fire and even the steps can retail sales data for the industry, it seems to be slowing down or stalling a little bit the last several months, really since the fall. And I noticed that you also produced a uh, bit less flour, I, I suppose that's attributed to the Omicron aspect. But I guess two-part question here with respect to what's been happening in the market. First is, you called out for your fiscal Q3 that you're expecting uh, market growth in your outlook. Um, so are you seeing now that the industry is growing again to, to new highs? And second part of the question is, based on where the market is today and what you expect over the near term, do you still believe that once you're at the, I think, almost 80,000 kilogram capacity, the market can still more than absorb that from you? Thank you. Perfect. So, so uh, a couple of, of key questions there, Tammy. So, so first of all, um, we we do see the market picking up. So it has been a little bit stalled over the last few months, um, as Stats Can has reported. Um, but given the opening um, of the, the you know communities, and we expect to see con we expect to see con um, you know concerts this summer and and fairs, and we expect to see the opening up generally of, of social activity. We do expect to see the market to rebound over the course of the next few months, especially uh, expecting a nice big um, lift coming up at 420. So so yes, we we think that that it will uh, rebound over the summer, and we'll st start to see the benefit of. Um, you know, those interactions. I, I think we miss, you know, some of the challenges we had even in the last few quarters where it stalled. You know, Quebec had this issue where they had required the vaccine passport to just get into the cannabis retail stores. So there was a little bit of a, a disruption from uh, from COVID over the last few months that has that had uh, stalled the category. But 
we expect with all the openings coming um, that that we will see a rebound for sure. So that's um, with regard to to the uh, market growth. And sorry, could you repeat your second part of the question? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering um, where you see it going, the, the, the near term, perhaps even medium term of the market. Like, are you still confident that once you reach your full capacity at Moncton, um, the market can still, you know, more than absorb that from you? Thanks. Right. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, so on that front, um, you know, number one, we do see some continued growth. As I mentioned on our last call, our current situation is that demand is outstripping our supply. So we have, uh, you know, our shred product is currently only being shipped to Ontario, Alberta, and we have some shipments going into Quebec, um, not meeting those needs. So we have limited our uh, distribution to other provinces, which is something that we will certainly expand once we have more capacity. Um, and then for now, we are a net buyer of product. We have to buy flour to meet the current demand. So we don't have any concerns about using the capacity we have in our Moncton expansion um, as we are already uh, using product, uh, buying product from external suppliers that we will buy from in-house once we have it up and running. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Bottomley from Canaccord Genuity. Your line is open. Uh, good morning. Congrats on the print this morning, and uh, thanks for taking these questions. Uh, you know, maybe just wanted to start, uh, maybe just at a higher level when it comes to what's happening in the Canadian market, just sort of piggybacking off of what, what Tammy was talking about as well. Um, just the fact that if you look at some of the incumbents in the space that started with, you know, close to 20% market share on, on recreational implementation in Canada, it's consistently been coming down where I think the leader in the space now has, you know, maybe a little over 10% market share. So where do you see this bottoming out, even though that Organigram has been doing very well and reaccelerating as of late? If you look at commoditized markets in, in the, you know, the U.S. like Colorado, Oregon, you know, market leaders there barely sort of eke out 5%. So I'm just curious where you think this is going in Canada, uh, barring any sort of major change in excise tax or federal re regulations in terms of the ability to secure, you know, um, outsized market share. Right. Thank you, Matt. Um, so, so first of all, I think that, um, you know, when you look at some of the bigger players who had, you know, 20 market share that dropped down to 10, I think one of the things that, that we see when we look at their performance is um, that, that you can't sit on your laurels. You can't sit with a product that's out in the marketplace and think it's going to keep delivering the sales delivered last quarter or the quarter before. You have to keep innovating. A lot of the focus of my comments this morning was around innovation. We know this is a category that needs to constantly be refreshed, bring new news, bring new innovation, excite the consumers. And I think that's something that we focused a lot of our time on. We introduced, you know, 90 new products. Um, over the course of the last 12 months. We focus a lot on rationalizing, taking out slower movers, bringing in new products just to keep it fresh. And this is something that I think has helped our momentum continue um, over the course of time. I, I think um, the question about what's going to happen long term, um, it's a highly fragmented market. We all know that there's a lot of small players um, that have less than 1% uh, of market share. Um, and that amount of players has grown. However, we also know that the provincial boards are starting to tighten up. They don't want to carry, um, you know, thousands of duplicate products. They want to manage how many items they have in their lineup. And one example I could share is as we took our Trombois hash out to some of the new provinces to get it listed, the feedback we got was they were excited that it was part of our portfolio because we're already a supplier to them and they don't have to set up another vendor. And so they were, you know, they might not have taken the Trombois hash from it's a unique vendor, but they were happy to have it in our portfolio. And I think that's a message that we have to recognize as this market matures, the provinces are going to want to deal with less vendors and the vendors that are full suppliers of a cross portfolio are going to be, you know, that uh, prioritized. We're going to have first access. We're going to have better opportunity to get better distribution, get our listings in. And that's going to help. So, so I do, do think that as it matures, you're going to find some of those smaller players sort of uh, drop off. 
you are going to see a consolidation. Um, but in the bigger players, you know, the need to keep it fresh, keep bringing in new news is very important, and that's been our focus. Great. Much, much appreciated. And just one follow-up for me on, on the consolidation part. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, over the last several years, you know, a half dozen or more um, acquisitions for these types of craft growers. Many of them have uh, actually turned out quite favorably in terms of um, their penetration or market share being a little more uh, sustainable uh, when it comes to pricing. Is there any other product categories or SKUs or classifications you think are kind of next in line for the industry to consolidate or just sort of any other commentary on where you think uh, M&A is going in the, the domestic uh, element of Canada? Uh, right. So, so first of all, I think we've seen different types of, of M&A over the last few um, few years. So there's been the um, big players who've acquired other big players and as a result had a lot of duplication and offerings and drove some obviously synergies but some rationalization of brands as well. Um, whereas one of the things that we focus on on our M&A strategy has been looking at our portfolio and seeing where there's gaps in our portfolio and really looking to find acquisitions that could fill those gaps. So the example, when we acquired um, uh, EIC, Edibles and Infusions Corporation, last April, we weren't in the gummy space, right? We, we acquired it um, in April. It was pre-revenue. By August, we launched the new gummies into the marketplace. We're now, you know, we've we, we're now the number three gummy player, right, in, you know, six months from when we launched into the market. So, you know, we found that hole. We, we recognized with our Laurentian acquisition that we needed a craft flower provider. We, did, we weren't in concentrates and concentrates with a growing segment. And we wanted to bolster our presence in the Quebec marketplace. Um, and that's working really well for us. Not only did we get the benefit of the higher margin uh, products that Laurentian has provided, but we've strengthened our relationship with the SQDC in Quebec, and we're seeing that reflected in the growth of our core organogram SKUs, not just the Trombois SKUs. So we've been very focused at looking at the portfolio and figuring out where we have to go that meets it. So it is accretive and incremental as opposed to just um, chasing market share that ends up with duplication might result in some uh, rationalization. Um, so uh, that's sort of our, our approach. In terms of, of your thoughts, where it's going to go, look, there's, um, there's a lot of players in flower. And there's, you know, flower is a big part of the category. But how do you differentiate over time is going to be important. And I think the, uh, you know, some of the fragmentation in the flower space is, you know, people want news, but the bigger players could keep bringing new strains, new news, and you don't need to have um, a, a separate, uh, you know, LP come out and, and set up for a one-time offer in and out. We, um, you know, we're really focused on our quality of our flower, growing it, improving both our terpenes and our THC and, and developing high quality product for our Edison brand and bringing some new strains out in the marketplace so they, the retailers don't feel they need to chase those craft um, or specialty uh, producers. And of course, we have our Laurentian craft flower as well. So that's, that's how we see it and, and hopefully can see, could keep growing and driving our market share um, as a result of that M&A approach. Good. Great. Appreciate all the color. Thank you. Your next question comes from a line of Douglas Mean from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Uh, thanks very much. My first question really has to do with your strategic thinking, Bina, as it relates to um, pricing in the marketplace. It seems you've done an excellent job from that perspective. Uh, but do you think some of the pricing declines in the marketplace that we've seen over the last 12 months are over? Are we at a base, or could we see some further erosion in overall pricing in the Canadian marketplace? Right, Doug. So, so here's, uh, and I think I talked about this last quarter. I think a lot of the price compression that we saw in flour um, has happened. I think we got to a point where flour pricing on the value segment is actually, you know, at or even slightly below what the illicit market is at. And so I think that a pressure on flour is mostly behind us. 
Um, we've also seen uh, with with less supply in the market in Canada, we've had some um, you know grow cultivation sites that have been shuttered. We've got a bit more balance between supply and demand that was pushing some of that price compression as well. So the the flower piece I think is uh, mostly behind us. Um, there is more compression that we'll expect to see. Um, we see it in vapes. We see it in concentrates. Um, and, and I think the important thing is that um, for us, recognizing that um, we, we don't shy away from the value segment. We think it's an important segment. It's a high volume segment. If you can make margin in the value segment and then build some more premium offerings in terms of your mix, you know, you, you've got it made. You, you can continue to drive your positive EBITDA. So, um, you know, I, I think that there could be other compression um, in some of those other segments um, until they reach that point where they're lining up to what the illicit market was offering. Um, that That's, you know, that's the, the pressure point. Um, and once, you know, people could buy the product through retail stores, you know, legal retail stores and get, at the same price and really if you look at some of the research results you know more better quality product um you know like why would you know that that's that's where it will settle down so hopefully that provides the color you are looking for yeah no very helpful um as a follow-up uh, you know what we're finding and i don't think this is a surprise but um the bun bud tenders play a, a key role in um you know focusing on what type of uh, product uh, uh, people should buy. And what do you think, uh, and, and an apparent preference for the smaller guy as well, relative to larger LPs. Um, so they do support the craft growers probably to a more significant extent um, than the larger players. Uh, what's your thinking on that? I, I know that um, you'll probably describe your strains and your innovation, but is there anything else that you can add as well? So, so listen, I think you're right. Bud tenders do play a very important role because consumers, there are consumers that come into those retail stores and they're asking questions and want some guidance on what to buy. Um, I think one of the things that we pride ourselves at Organogram is we have our own dedicated sales force. We have feet on the street across the country. Uh, we spend a lot of time engaging with bud tenders, not only sharing with them, you know, what, what our products, our strains are, but we do um, education programs with them. We run, um, you know, we go in and we set up um, in-store activations. Um, and so we have relationships in-store um, and we promote, you know, the, the breadth of our portfolio. Um, and so if there is a bud tender that's focused on craft, or more premium flowers, we'll focus a lot of our attention on our Edison brand or bring in our Laurentian craft flower now. You've got some bud tenders that are really looking for the innovative products. So when we introduce something like our ShredX uh, Keith infused blends, you know, we, we're introducing something new and exciting that's high potency, you know, really great feedback on our Tremblant hash as we've taken the education of what hash is out to the marketplace, how it's used, and done a lot of education with the bud tenders. You know, and then, you know, in our gummies, look, we came into the market with products that were um, at a price point that was more accessible to a lot of consumers, and we got a lot of positive feedback from the bud tenders that, you know, now people could buy, you know, uh, uh, four gummies for for under five dollars, as opposed to the um, you know eight dollars that was being charged before, and so a significant benefit. So I think there's you know it's not all about price; it's about price and value and you know uniqueness and offering, and all those factor into what a bun what a bud tender might recommend to a consumer. So we spend a lot of time with that connection with bud tenders, talking about our portfolio. And uh, we feel that they uh, often recommend our products. So it's not just the little guy that they recommend. They're recommending quality products, and we feel we have a really good portfolio. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your next question comes from a line of Ty Collin from 8 Capital. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for taking my question, and congrats on the really solid improvement in gross margin this quarter. 
Could you help us unpack the key moving pieces there in terms of what drove that gross margin improvement? Just, you know, how much of that was due to Laurentian? How much from the larger international shipments? How much from product mix, for example? Appreciate any color you could provide there. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Ty. Um, Derek, I'll pass that over to you. Perfect. Uh, I would say uh, you you outlined a couple of the points that um, – that were key in terms of improving the margin, but it was um, a little bit of uh, everything in terms of a product mix. No question, there was more with the international shipment, which has been uh, outlined earlier without the um, excise tax. It has uh, uh, a much higher uh, margin than most uh, rec flour does. That was helpful. There generally, we have an ink, as well as the contribution from Laurentian, which um, as, as a craft uh, grow and with the hash product does attract higher margins uh, in that business. And there was a contribution there that did assist the quarter. But I think the other element that's really key is just with overall continued sales of growth over the last few quarters and with higher levels of production, we're just starting to achieve economies of scale and getting a lower cost of production on an overall basis, which is helping the margin in all our product categories. And, and we expect that lift to continue as we, as we look forward, given that we harvested 10,000 kilos in the quarter. That's an annualized rate of 40,000. We do believe we leave the fiscal year at 80,000 and that we have the capacity to sell that product on uh, as per a flow through. And we're just a large component of our costs are fixed in nature just by operating at these higher levels, we do over time get a, a lower cost per unit. And this is just providing a general lift uh, for the company in the, in the quarter, and as was partially seen last quarter as well. And uh, we expect this to continue. Great, thanks for that. And then just uh, for my follow-up, uh, a bit more of a market level question. Uh, given some of the pressures on consumers' pocketbooks here between inflation and rising borrowing costs, are you seeing customers uh, starting to trade down into value categories at all? And is that a risk to your plan to kind of emphasize more premium SKUs in your sales mix? Uh, yeah, so so first of all, um, I think um, our sales mix, look, we have a lot of value products, and I think that uh, we don't shy away from them. Um, we could make margin on our value products as well as our premium. Um, you have to be able to meet different consumers are, are driven by different uh, sensitivities. And obviously, um, there's a big consumer group that are looking for the lower price products. Um, still high quality, but lower price. Um, but there are the cannabis enthusiasts and sort of craft seekers that want the higher quality products. So we want to make sure we're offering the different uh, products to the different consumers what they're looking for. In terms of pressures to the pocketbook, there's no question. Um, we all know that um, cost of living has gone up. I think what we saw over the course of COVID was that um, people were buying um, into the cannabis market to address stress, to address uh, relaxation. It wasn't all about partying and discretionary. It became more of a, you know, something to help them get through some of the challenges. and. And look, while I'd like to admit that, that we're excited about more of the recreational uh, time over the summer, the pressure on, you know, inflation and cost increases is out there. And we think that um, our products offer consumers an opportunity to, you know, uh, address those stresses and, and, and feel, you know, and, and feel good about, um, you know, their, their day, right? So it's, it's a little bit of, of a help and a, you know, and a little bit, um, and it's, a, it's an important addition to, I think, their lifestyle. So um, I don't really expect there would be a, a very big impact other than perhaps a, more of a shift to the more value product. And that will, of course, uh, benefit us. We, we're happy to be a value supplier along with the premium supplier. Great. Thanks, Nina. Thanks, Derek. Your next question comes from a line of Frederico Gomez from ATB Capital Markets. Your line is open. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for, for taking my questions. Um, just on your uh, growth margin, uh, you guys are showing some good uh, growth there, a uh, good expansion. Can, can you talk about the differences in margins between your, your rack sales in Canada and your international sales and, and how much of that uh, margin expansion 
is coming from a mix with, with higher uh, international. Thank you. Derek? I'll take that. Yes. Um, well, I guess our international uh, uh, revenues were 4.4 uh, million in Q2, which is a you know one of the highest that we had as a, as a as a total and um, as as a percent to our total on revenue as a company as noted we we don't have the excise on it it does attract a much higher uh, margin than our rec business um, despite our margins also in, improving in our rec business as well uh, we've been lowering the cost of production at the facility and this uh, is helpful for all uh, product categories including pre rolls as well. So we don't publicly disclose, I guess, our, our margin by um, by distribution channel. And so it's a difficult question to, to, to answer in the sense that we just don't provide that specific guidance. But we do, uh, the international shipments are an important part of our business. We do have a cadence of uh, ensuring that we, we, we try to have a quarterly shipments and um, we will expect to continue to do so. Uh, but the both businesses are growing, and we expect to have uh, more flour available at the end of the year to supply uh, both these markets. And when we do so, it'll be at a lower cost per unit just from economies of scale. But in terms of getting granular on what is the margin by distribution channel, that's just um, guides we haven't historically pr provided or published. So uh, apologies, it's not it's not the clearest answer to the, to the question, but uh, uh, but it's just not guidance we provide. Yeah, no, 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 sure, I understand that. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and then, when you look at your your market share uh, and, and your growth outlook uh, through the remainder of this year, um, which uh, product categories do you expect you gain uh, most market share in? You know, I, we know that uh, you are a leader in flour, but uh, you know, uh, do you expect you to gain a lot of share in edibles, vapes, or, or continue to gain share in flour? So. Uh, any caller on on specific um, product categories? Thank you. Um, right. So thanks, Fred. Um, I think. Listen, we we just launched a bunch of new products. We're very excited about our Shredex Bait. Um, it's a known fact that we are uh, very underdeveloped in this segment, um, and we have a great brand in Shred um, with you know bold flavors, and we could reproduce those flavors in our vape offerings. Um, initial offtake, we have shipped to New Brunswick, sold out very quickly on our initial shipment. So we do expect to see some growth coming from um, our vape launch. Um, you know, as I mentioned in, in my uh, point earlier, we have a bunch of new innovation coming into the gummy space. You know, really on our shred ends, building out that lineup from three SKUs to eight provides us bigger presence. We expect to uh, continue to drive um, our market share on the gummies uh, segment and, you know, are seeing um, great results in certain retailers where we're, you know, already the number one gummy supplier. So that certainly is, you know, a goal of ours to continue to drive the growth in the gummy space. With regard to concentrates, uh, remember, we only had uh, basically two months of uh, Laurentian in our Q2 results. Um, so we do expect to see not only an increase um, based on, you know, having the full quarter, but obviously, as I mentioned, we're expanding our distribution. We've started to ship uh, to some of the Atlantic provinces already. We have um, shipments expected to go out to BC. Um, so that expanded distribution on uh, concentrates on top of, you know, the extra volume just from a full quarter um, should help us really increase our market share on the concentrates um, section as well. Uh, so, so we're very, I would say that while flour is, is obviously very important, we're number one in flour and we'll keep uh, driving, you know, to, to fulfill flour requirements. Where we see our biggest market share gains are going to be from some of those 2.0 categories that we believe uh, could strengthen, you know, our full breadth of portfolio, but will also improve our margins. They tend to be higher margin uh, segments as well. Uh, thank you. That that's really helpful. Uh, congrats on the quarter again. Uh, I'll back with you. Your next question comes from the line of Owen Bennett from Jeffries. Your line is open. Good morning, guys. Hope all well. Um, first question. I just wanted to come back to. 
The sales mix, obviously, really impressive market share traction, um, but does appear to be driven at the value end with Shred, and a lot of the new launches are also with Shred. So I was just wondering, could you give maybe a bit more color on your actual sales mix currently between value and premium? And then what you're doing exactly to address the top end of the market. Obviously, you've bought Laurentian, you've got Edison, but interested in how you see that, that sales mix evolving going forward or how you'd like to see it evolve in an ideal world. Thank you. Right. So thank you. Um, let, me, let me say that, so our flower sales, if I look at the mix over time, um, you know, if I go back to – fourth quarter of 21, we had about 68% of our business was our flower and 18% were our blends, which was our shred. Um, if you fast forward to this quarter, you know, the flower went from 68 to 58% and blends held roughly the same from 18 to 19. So uh, these are percent of our total revenue. So I get, I guess the message is, you know, we're holding our position in flower by continuing to innovate and bring new strains and meet the consumer needs. But um, the focus on our growth has really been in expanding some of those other uh, areas, right? I mean, edibles, um, obviously new to us in, in our fourth quarter at 3% now represents 9% of, of our business in Q2. Um, concentrates, which we didn't have, uh, now represents 5%. Um, you know, and I, I forgot to mention earlier, we have um, the number one few in the ingestible extracts category with our jolts, the high lozenge, um, uh, high potency lozenge that we have out in the marketplace. And it really is, it's unique, it's differentiated, patent pending, and it continues to grow. Um, there's a lot of interest in that product, and we've just uh, introduced a couple new flavors into the marketplace. So um, the mix is changing by adding 2.0 products while continuing to make sure we have, you know, news and, and unique offerings in our flower and in our blends. Okay, thanks, Sam. And then the next question is, I mean, how are you trending currently with the available capacity? And then when will construction on Moncton be completed? And then just linked to that, how much of a boost do you think to gross margins would you foresee when Moncton is complete and, and running at full scale? Thank you. Right. So I'll start and then I'll pass it over to uh, Derek to answer the question on the gross margins. So currently we're running at capacity. So we um, are, you know, basically, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, our demand is outstripping our supply. As soon as product comes off uh, the line, gets through our testing and our packaging, we're shipping it out the door. So, you know, what, what's ending up in the marketplace is fresh, high-quality flour. Um, and we um, are, you know, we don't have any spare capacity. So we are currently buying from external um, uh, customers, making sure, obviously, the quality meets our specification. Um, and look forward to when we'll be able to, um, you know, supply our own product as the uh, expansion comes online. So your question of when do we expect that? Um, we expect to be planting in the um, 4C expansion by the end of Q3, um, and we expect to be harvesting flour out of that, uh, out of those new rooms in Q4 of this year. So we're well on our way. Um, very excited about getting the extra capacity. Um, as I said, beyond, um, you know, there's opportunity to expand our distribution of, of shred um, into some other markets, uh, we, which we haven't been able to do. Um, and we have, you know, we'll explore further opportunities um, as we, you know, we have the capacity to, to provide it. So we've been somewhat restricted um, and uh, we look forward to having that extra capacity. Um, Derek, over to you on the margins. Yeah, I think when comparing Q2 of this year to Q2 of last year, it sort of um, demonstrates uh, the impact to to the financials just on changing production levels. In Q2 of uh, 2021, we were harvesting, you know, approximately 4,000 uh, kilos in in a quarter, and we ended up reporting in in that quarter a negative adjusted gross margin, so a negative 
And just by moving up to our current capacity, which was in around the 40 to 45,000 level prior to completing construction, uh, along with other process improvements and initiatives at the facility, we've taken that negative adjusted gross margin. And in this print for Q2, we have a 26% adjusted gross margin, a 31% swing. Uh, now, I'm not indicating that I'm expecting a similar growth to margin um, in terms of an extra 31% being added on as we go forward to capacity, but it is only to indicate the level of volatility the margin has as a con direct consequence of the cost of production. And by uh, in doubling our effectively doubling the output of the facility um, at the end of, as we go into the early parts of next year from where we are today, will provide a, you know, a lift to um, our reduction of cost that is significant enough that'll make a meaningful difference to our adjusted gross margin in those future periods. But I'm not gonna provide specific guidance on it, but uh, the, the, the lift that we've had to date is really, we haven't increased capacity yet. We've just increased our planning and have done other uh, improvements at the facility on whether it's labor management or other, um, you know, uh, packaging review on, on materials, et cetera, that have allowed us to achieve uh, an improved margin. So we just think that by getting to this higher level of scale, that ultimately there's great opportunity for us to continue to see uh, positive uh, improvements to the adjusted margin that we're otherwise reporting on. Great, thank you, very helpful. Your next question comes from the line of Andrew Parthenio from Stiefel GMP. Your line is open. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. This is Aiden Jean Gregorio speaking on behalf of Andrew. Um, just curious, diving into Quebec a little bit more, could you provide any additional color on how the sales of your products are doing specifically uh, in the Quebec market and what's working well there? Uh, right. So, so I think I would say to you that um, our product is in Quebec is is performing uh, probably um, sort of flatlining a little bit based on what we acquired. Um, as it required a little bit of refresh, the product was in the market for a while, and the thing that we've seen over and over again is you need to have sort of new news, and we have uh, we've been working on uh, great new innovation and upgrades that we could bring into the Quebec marketplace to make sure it continues to be a fresh offering there. But taking what is a, a tremendous product that, that was available in the Quebec market for the last year and rolling it out to some of the other markets where it's new and uh, seeing great results as a result of that. So I think, um, you know, one of the things we're, we're doing is um, getting the right uh, offering into Ontario market. We have, uh, we've been converting from a 24 pack down to a 12 pack to make sure that the independent trade in Ontario will, will pick it up. Um, not too big a ring for them to bring it in. And we're spending a lot of time educating the, the bud tenders on that product. So we're really excited about what, um, the Trombla hash could do for us. But in terms of Quebec specifically, we, um, we're on to some innovation, some exciting innovation that we're, um, ex you know, want to bring into the Quebec market to just keep it fresh and make sure that we maintain the momentum and some of the reasons why we bought um, the business. I will say, as I, I mentioned earlier, that not only is the acquisition was not only to get the, um, the Trombois and Laurentian, Laurentian brands in Quebec, but it was also to strengthen our relationship with SQDC. And we have seen a significant increase in our base organogram business in Quebec as a result of building that relationship. Okay, um, great. Thank you for the additional color. Uh, and I'll step back in the queue. Your next question comes from a line of Michael Freeman from Raymond James. Your line is open. Hi, Bina. Hi, Derek. Thanks, and thanks for taking our questions, and congratulations on this uh, this uh, booming quarter. Um, um, I would like to ask some questions about the uh, BAT uh, PDC uh, Research Alliance, and um, I wonder if you could provide any color on um, focuses of this of this research alliance. You described sort of the the, the R and D facilities being uh, substantially completed now, but I guess. Um, if you could describe the activity of those teams that will be working on those innovation products, um, how perhaps Hyacinth's um, uh, cultured cannabinoid innovations um, might be folded into those activities, and um, how 
And you previously described sort of an IP-driven entry or at least approach to international and specifically U.S. markets. Um, I wonder if you could provide some color on uh, on these things. Uh, so, certainly. So, first of all, with regard to the product development collaboration, um, as we've mentioned before, the focus is predominantly in CBD, uh, which is the area that uh, we're doing most of the uh, really scientific research. Uh, the focus is um, looking at improving, um, you know, efficacy, you know, uh, onset, um, you know, just the delivery mechanisms. There's, it's a lot of fundamental research that starts with um, that we could then, you know, leverage as we launch new products to bring into our portfolio. So the teams at the product development uh, uh, center and the, the, our, our internal R&D teams work together. So as we learn more about the product, we learn how to improve the offerings that we have in our portfolio through our own R&D. So that's an exciting development um, that's, that's happening already. Um, as I mentioned, we're just completing the biolab. And so what that means is more advanced scientific research on um, the plant, uh, plant genetics is going to happen as we move forward. Um, so that's the, that's what's happening in our PDC. Um, in terms of hyacinth, at this point, they're not connected, but for us, the whole focus is around innovation, and we see there's an opportunity um, that at some point we'll look at API that potentially is higher purity that comes out of biosynthesis that isn't from uh, cannabis plants that might be more appropriate for certain markets. So we wanted to make sure that we have that, uh, you know, opportunity to be connected in the biosynthesis space as well. And in terms of longer-term IP, we know that moving flower across borders is difficult, but if we develop IP, that really becomes the opportunity to take it into new markets. So it's something that we continue to work on together with our partners. That's perfect. Brian. Very helpful. Thanks. Um, and quickly, on the uh, 4C expansion, you mentioned that planting is uh, is going to be happening there at the by the end of third quarter, harvesting in fourth quarter. But wondering how you could how you would describe the timelines um, between um, cultivation ramp from you know around 50,000 kilogram run rate capacity um, sort of today to full capacity with 4C included of, of around 80,000 kilograms a year. Um, how would you describe the timeline of, of that ramp? Um, Jared, do you want to grab that one? Yes, I can. I would indicate that right now we're approximately at 45,000. We would leave August around 80, 80,000 kilos a year in terms of the annualized rate. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the ramp is pretty heavy right now to July. And August, in terms of when that uh, that comes up, just as a consequence of that, um, you know, you have to sort of complete the construction while we're not planting in all rooms at the same time. There is, it's going to be staggered, just in terms of, um, um, you know, labor management and uh, and and taking into consideration uh, the construction work. Uh, but it would be really starting to ramp up heavily into the. July and August period and going from, say, 45,000 annualized kilos to 80,000 annualized kilos. All right. And, Derek, a, a very quick follow-up on that. It, like, I understand that uh, escalating cultivation will, will imp uh, should improve margins based on the co economies of scale. Um, but do you – might we expect a, a margin blip as you, as you undergo this, this aggressive ramp in, in cultivation and planting out? I'm not sure it would be a, um, you know, like a cost blip. It would be more or less there's a delay in terms of, of when you're harvesting and the cost that you have on it to when it hits your income statement because you almost have that one month delay to when the product sold. So ultimately, in terms of all of the rooms turning, you're talking about the end of August, and that really starts to uh, impact the cost of the inventory that's expensed during Q1 of next year. And uh, but you know, I think there'll be with some of the rooms coming on during, you know, some of the harvest coming on from the new from the new rooms in June, July, that there will be some uh, economies of scale and therefore lower costs that will um, benefit, um, you know, the Q4 margin, but that the the real 
uh, improvement comes after a, you know, some time has set on operating at that higher level, which again, we think we're leaving fiscal 2022 with the full capacity room harvest. Sorry, thank you very much. So there are um, no further. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know we've run, we, we run a little bit over our time, so I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited about the momentum on our business, and uh, we look forward to updating you on our progress. I will wish everybody a happy 420 for next week, and with that, I'd like to end the call. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.